Hi, I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, where we have a brand new ebook waiting for you absolutely free at businessofstory.com. It's called The Five Stages of Grief in Telling Your Business Story How to Overcome Story Fright to Grow Your Leadership, People, and Organization. In it, we help you deal with things like denial that story actually works, or anger, I don't know how to tell a story, bargaining, I'll do anything but tell a story, depression, I have no good stories to tell, and finally, we're going to land you on acceptance of the power of story in your life. You'll become a master storyteller when you go to businessofstory.com and download your free ebook right now, and then... Start living into your most potent stories. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. I read the other day that in 2011, the term storyteller was nowhere to be found in people's descriptions on LinkedIn. Now, there are over one half million folks on LinkedIn claiming themselves as storytellers. At least they have it in their descriptions. So it's become quite the buzzword. But what I've experienced is that most of these quote unquote storytellers tell you that storytelling is important with your brand and in your business, but they don't actually show you how to do it to become an intentional and powerful storyteller. There is no doubt that storytelling works to connect with people on a very primal level and move them to action. I believe it because I've experienced the magic of being a storytelling ape, probably just like you. Ira Glass, host of This American Life, who draws 1.7 million listeners every single week to a story, said the power of anecdote is so great that it has a momentum all its own. He contends that no matter how boring the facts are, with a well-told story, you feel like you're on a train that has a destination. So no wonder we call it the theater of the mind, the stories that play out in our noggin and that we live into. And no wonder it's become such a buzzword in advertising and marketing, but it's much more than a buzzword for those of us that really try to bring you story artists and content and tools that show you how to become an intentional and powerful storyteller. I mean, that's the whole thing behind the business of story and why I'm hoping you're here to listen today. Because stories shape who we are individually and collectively. But you got to be careful because when we hear them on the Ira Glass scale, we're tempted to think that our stories don't measure up. Even as our over-communicated world implores you to tell your story, my goal is to show you how. And it's about stop looking for your epic story and start finding your scenes. This is what I've learned. Compelling storytelling is always about the moments. Your moments are composed of your experiences, and these experiences define your beliefs. Your beliefs lead to your truth. And when you unwrap your truth, you will find your superpower. That same superpower you can use to nudge the world in any direction you choose. So forget about your story right now and find your scenes, those moments that have shaped who you are today. Our guest today is all about enabling your superpower through your unique scenes that have made you you. Michelle Weinstein, entrepreneur extraordinaire and Shark Tank survivor, promises to help you close any deal that comes your way, sell more products or services, value your worth, overcome any objection, and turn a no into yes so you can serve more people and make a bigger difference in this world. Michelle shares with you what she learned during her own highs and lows of building a robust business, how persistence pays, and then the sorrow and rejuvenation that happened to her when she closed down her beloved enterprise and started all over. It's quite a journey, so let's begin. Michelle, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. 
awesome. We have the pitch queen here on Business of Story. And I would imagine in your line of work of helping people overcome their fear and trepidation of sales. <laughs> and as you say on your website, to double your growth and, you know, in spending half the time doing it, man, you got my attention. How do you use story to make that happen? You know, it's, it is all about the story. So I love that that's your focus and that's what we get to talk about because people want to connect with people and people want to buy from people. And the more stories you tell, I always think the better. And there's definitely a fine line. I have one partner in one of my businesses that I have and he likes to talk a lot but a little too much. So if you go overboard with your stories, it can, you know, drive a, lo- a few people a little crazy. But I think definitely sharing your stories and sharing who and what you're about and why, what's important to you and what are your values and who do you want to work with and what do you look for in a client and sharing more about you authentically will ultimately help you also increase your revenues. So... <laughs> Yeah, and, and really using those stories to convey an expertise you might have or a character trait, you know, be it persistence, be it loyalty, being it a can-do attitude is always way more powerful if you demonstrate that in a true story well told versus just coming out and saying those attributes. Right. So, I mean, I have a really funny story on that. So I've been told I am extremely persistent and it, it's a story that, I am that way, but when people explain it, they go so into depth. Like when I got my, in my last business, we did prepared meals and I got our products into a store called the Vitamin Shop. They have over 800 retail stores nationwide. And when I first met the buyer for the protein bar category, because I had a protein bar as well, and that's what we started with. He would tell the story so detailed, like, Michelle, you looked at my badge, you looked at me, you said, are you the buyer buyer? And, you know, I was walking down aisles and aisles looking for a few specific people, and he was one of them. And from that moment, he always remembered me because I stopped him, I introduced myself, I made him laugh. I always think it's really important to make someone laugh. And from there on, a long lasting relationship happened and started from that moment of me being so persistent, finding the buyer from the vitamin shop in the category that I was trying to get into, and then being persistent and working with him to get our bars in, I think it was about 80 stores. And then we brought our fresh food products in and vitamin shop ended up investing a little over $1 million in a test project for 10 stores. And this was not like a small test. This is a billion dollar company trying something small on a test pilot in just 10 of their stores in New York and New Jersey, where they had to renovate 10 stores and put refrigeration systems. They didn't have any cold distribution. It was like, if you thought of any challenge that could come with trying something, we had every single one of those challenges. (laughs) And then going all the way into what we had a niche in pro sports. So every year we would go to the NFL combine And when I was starting out in my last business, I didn't know that you had to get booth space at the NFL Combine in order to have people stop by and see your products and specifically being all the teams. So we actually got kicked out of the convention center a couple times just because we were so persistent. And I, you know, I had no idea. I just was in the convention center. I thought it was public space. (laughs) <laughs> Not so much with the NFL. Not so much with the NFL. That is correct. And then we got smart. And over the last few years, we did pay for a booth, but we never stayed at our booth. We always stayed in the hallways of the convention center because then we were able to see the people we wanted to see instead of wait for people to come see us at our table. Mm-hmm. So, Michelle, have you always been like this since you were a little girl? I mean, thinking about <laughs> this persistence and selling and using story to get there? I'm not sure if I would say I was always like this, but I would say a lot of it I think is just in me. My mom is from Moscow, so I am half Russian, and I think that's just how they are. You know, when you come and immigrate into the U.S. and come from nothing with two suitcases to creating a successful life, it doesn't come easy. So that's how that's the only thing I saw. And I only saw if you want to get what you want in life, you have to work for it and be persistent and do all the things that I'm doing today. I mean, I am like a professional pet professional hustler. You're not like the hustlers on the streets. We're talking like in business. So. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. 
And did, well, but did you always know you want to do this? Or what did you study in school that prepared you to be, you know, the pitch queen? Yeah, so in school, I actually have a finance degree. And in school, I think it taught me what completion meant, how to complete something three, you know, 360. But I would say that the pitch queen was born from all of these experiences that I have, like everything that I've learned from getting a small company, fresh products, no preservatives into a billion dollar retailer. I have been through every challenge from pitching to the wrong people to finding decision makers to having the CEO fly out and meet with me two different times, you know, when we did that a couple years ago, to pitching to buyers at Costco. Everybody wants their products in Costco if you have that type of product, right? If you have a consumable or something that a Costco person would buy when they're roaming the aisles, it is where you want to be. And, you know, I was able to pitch the buyers and get our products in there. I did not succeed with the meals, but that's just because there wasn't enough margin. So it's kind of like a catch 22 and you have fresh food. You need the volume, but if you don't have the volume, then you can't get the price that you need that Costco requires. So You know, I've done all of these really, I guess you could call it outside of the box style pitching that, you know, I want to share it with the masses and I want to share it with entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, business owners that for me, it comes easy now, but I know for a lot of people it doesn't. And what's one thing that maybe we talk about today that you can actually take away and put into action today? Like just if you guys get one thing out of today, then I am a happy camper. Well, okay. Here are the two things I want out of this today for business of story is how I can double my sales and work half as much, like you said on your website. So right. let's go <laughs> let's go into that then. <laughs> how to do that. But before we get into that, so it sounds to me like you are very street savvy and persistent and in some cases naive to the way it's going on, but actually work in your favor. <laughs> Correct. Such as the NFL. You didn't know it's public space. I should be able to just come in here and they're, uh, no, we get a slice of your action if you're going to be in here. So how has that worked in your favor? Yeah, I would, I would definitely, I would say, use the word naive. I think that's actually okay to say. And it's worked in my favor in multiple ways. I mean, I would always just try something new. And I think with my personality coupled with some of the things that I say, for example, when I was working with the vitamin shop, I would say the buyer's name was Michael. Michael, I'm in New York. Do you have time on Tuesday to meet? We should really meet to go over next steps. I'm in your area. Just so you know, I was not in the area. I was actually going to New York just to have a meeting with them because I knew that if I didn't, they might start working with our our competition. So I did things like that in order to gain the, you know, I don't know if it's called, if you want to call it attention, but I got to the point where they're like, wow, this person is going to do and go above and beyond. We want to work with her because Just like with whatever your services are that you're providing or the people listening, what is something that you can do to go above and beyond that someone down the street or your competitor is not going to do? And when you can come up with a list of like maybe three to five things that you can actually implement and put in place today, you will be able to make double the money and work half the time. I promise. And I would imagine these aren't necessarily hard, onerous things to do. They're they're more clever of something that, like, for instance, uh, my wife and I, we had our house for sale out here in Phoenix, and it was on the market for eight months, right? I mean, beautifully located. It is close to everything. And we couldn't get an offer on it for what we were asking. And it's a beautiful home. It's 4,300 square feet. It's got a huge swimming pool. It's just, it's a place where we raised our kids. Did you have furniture and things inside? or was it empty? No, it wasn't totally empty. We scaled it way, 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 way back because my wife's an interior designer okay. and a collector. Yeah. So we got all that out yeah. of there. But, and we repainted, we took all the beautiful color off the walls and painted it, you know, just kind of a, a pale white right. or something. She was heartbroken to do it, but you know, that's what they told us to do. Well, we couldn't sell it. Okay. So we said, you know what, let's put it on Airbnb and see what happens. We're going to market it as your micro resort in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. You can find it on um, VRBO. And we just told about, here's what you got. You got four bedrooms, actually sleeps 12 people, your own swimming pool, your own putting green, your own pool table, your own walk-up bar, blah, 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 blah. And we have had it booked 
since we put it online in the middle of May. And by the way, this isn't a big sales push. I'm actually getting to my point. The middle of May and we have people, it's been booked solidly pretty much since then and now into June of this year. Yeah. And what? Something little simple that we do that I just love that I I get tickled about because I think I enjoy it maybe more than our guests do is I have a bottle of red wine waiting for them when they get there and my favorite chocolate chip mint ice cream sitting in the freezer and a little note saying, welcome to our home, make it your home while you're here. And as a thank you or or to kick off your vacation, here's a bottle of wine on us and a little secret in the refri- in the freezer. Well, of course, they're not sure it's in the freezer. So then they go and they get yeah, greeted by the ice cream. <laughs> it costs me $22 right. to do it. It's not, it's the little you things. It. Yeah. It, <laughs> you know, it's really the little things. And I, I also have a podcast that I, I interview really a lot of cool people that I've met in the last like 10, 20 years of my life. And we talk about the no's and the rejections that you get in sales. And, you know, one of the things that I always hear is that when I, I, every time I'm done, I send a thank you card for the holidays. Everyone got a hat and a travel water bottle and they were just like blown away because most people don't do anything. And it's a way, it's a form of sales and building relationships. So you know, whatever your business is or services, what what's something small like you did with mint ice cream and a red a bottle of red wine that it's it's not going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to cost you the time to think about what you're going to do, and mm-hmm. and you're probably going to love doing it too. That's the other key thing. Like I had so much fun flying on a plane to surprise these guys, and then I told them when I got to New York, like actually I wasn't in the area. I just made it up to see what you were going to say, and they even thought that was even funnier. <laughs> They're like, "Wow, you!" Yeah. And and people, you know, even if you're listening right now, you guys can steal this tactic. If you work with people in different cities, make up reasons why you're going to that city. It works every time. There is not someone that would turn you down for a meeting or a lunch. If you go to lunch, make sure you pay. That's not going to meet with you if you say, I'm in town. If there's that big client you want to work with, or for me, like a big person I want to interview, like I really want to interview Les Brown, and I know he's going to be in somewhere, I'm just going to show up. And it works every time. I'm, I kid you not, just try it. <laughs> I'm going to try that. Just try then. it. You For any it. of you that are selling, you know, a high value service or product or pitching, it just, just show up to places and let the people know that you're in town for a short amount of time. You want to create a call to action that's not too far away to create that sense of urgency like, oh, well, Michelle's leaving in a day. I better meet her today. <laughs> yes, you better. And, yeah. you know, have a real good game plan put together. Well, half of success is showing up and the other half is following up. So I'm with you there. You got yourself on Shark Tank. How did you do that? I did that with a lot of what we just talked about. So I did Shark Tank season four. So that was a little while ago. And at the time, my company was pretty much just starting. So even our protein bars were in cardboard boxes. What were you selling? Protein bars that got you on Shark Tank? Protein bars and fresh prepared meals. Yeah. Okay. So my mission was how can I help people change their lives one meal at a time? And I was determined. I really believe that how you feel, how you look, how how everything happens and how your brain functions is 80% of what you eat and drink, you know, fluids, water, you know, if you're drinking the sodas and eating a lot of candy and fast food, it's probably like not that good. And you probably don't feel all that great all the time. So I believe that your energy source, which is your food, and I still believe it to this day, which you can probably tell, Mm -hmm. is directly correlated with how well you sleep, how well you perform at work, how well you work with your clients, how well you're pitching your products and all of the successes and results that you have in life. And I I reached out and I found all the producers on LinkedIn, on Twitter. I reached out to all of them on social media. I also applied with a video on their website right when they put it up, like right when they were taking applications. So I literally was like probably one of the first people they called because I got them before they got inundated for that season. So that would be one of my tactics is if there's some show you want to be on, make sure you apply like the first they, first second they announce it. It's kind of like getting in line for a new iPhone, right? If you really want that new iPhone, you're camping out the night before. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so you've got the chutzpah and you got the hustle. (laughs) But, you know, come on, you don't have that sexy of a product. It's protein bars and fresh prepared meals. How did you make it interesting enough to get them to bring you on? Well, I think what makes it interesting is you. So, you know, if you're pretty boring and you have a pretty general product, you might not get on, but you have to create that uniqueness factor. And so it was interesting. I went through the interview process. They did one phone call and then they did a video interview and I just brought my personality in. At the time I had a retail store, so I did it in our retail store and I gave them a like a visual tour. And then um, from there, they went through the next process where I had to do a more professional video. And I showed them all the aspects of the business, which I think was unique compared to a lot of our competition at the time. You you could buy online, but we actually had a physical store that I offered free yoga. You could get a free nutrition consultation. You could buy your food. You could get your kombucha. Like you could do everything in this like one-stop shop solution. The problem was I just had one store. I wanted hundreds of stores, <laughs> which mm-hmm. led me to the deal I got with Vitamin Shop because I thought that was going to be my success in getting our products nationwide in a local presence for consumers to get easy access to healthy food at not an expensive price. So, I mean, that's how I got on Shark Tank. And then when you put your pitch together, you get to give the producers the first draft or round. And then, I mean, they help you from picking out your outfits to what are you going to do on TV? You know, I had like a hot dog that I threw in a trash can. It was pretty funny. So, But take us through like when you were selling these, you're pitching the producers and you're doing your videos and so forth. Was there something in the story that you knew was really working? And conversely, was there something in your pitch that you're into it? You're saying, oh, this isn't resonating and I've got to change either the story itself or the approach in in, in which I'm telling it. I think the thing that was probably the most interesting to the producers and why they chose it was because my parents haven't always been the healthiest of people. And they still aren't today. And I have this thing that I am not going to be like my parents and that I believe everyone should have an opportunity to eat clean and eat healthy no matter what the excuse is. So most of the people would say, I don't have time to cook. I don't have time to clean. I don't have time to grocery shop. I have to work. I need to go to the gym. I just don't have time to do all this stuff to eat healthy. And for the people like me who didn't like to cook, Unless you're just eating out, there's really no other alternatives. And so I think the producers really like that angle. My dad had some heart issues. It was about two, three years ago. And he went to a plant-based diet and his cardiologist said, oh, what did you do? You know, and instead of giving a bunch of prescription pills, my cure is just change what you eat. You can actually prevent everything and any problem that most people have in this country just by changing your food intake. And I think they saw the passion in that. And, you know, that was part of the story and in the pitch. So really, you humanized your overall pitch of the protein bars, and the fresh prepared meals by attaching it to a personal experience and family member Correct. saying that I love my parents. They don't always eat the best and they're not always in the best shape. And so I thought I'm not going to allow this to happen to me. Maybe I can get them on board, but more so I can take this out to the world and show them a better way to eat. Right. And maybe inspire another person at the time to, you know what? She's right. You know, her dad could avoid the heart issues and things if he just didn't eat French fries and, you know, Chinese food all the time. Like maybe 20% of the time that's okay, but 80% of the time you should be eating something that is nutritious and delicious. So that was really the unique selling point to our food was, oh my gosh, it was really healthy and the macronutrient breakdowns on the food were really good, but it also tasted good. And the sharks really loved how it tasted because I had to bring food up, I gave them samples. One of the funniest things that, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of and I thought it would go the way it went was Kevin O'Leary decided to I made a corker on Caesar salad because Barbara was there and I was really hoping she was going to invest and Kevin said oh Michelle can I see the salad and I said yeah sure so I brought him over the salad the corker on Caesar salad and he started to pick off it had diced chicken on top and we used all free range meats And he started to toss the pieces of chicken off the salad. And then when all of the chicken was off the salad and all that was left was the lettuce and tomato and like the little tortilla crisps we put on there, 
he said, now this is a product that might have some margin in it. <laughs> <laughs> because all of the margins and costs was in the free range chicken, you know, food has a high, it was in the protein. Was in the protein mm -hmm. Yeah. So imagine him <laughs> literally flicking chicken off the salad until every piece of chicken is gone. And I'm trying not to crack up and laugh. I was just standing there like, Oh my God, this is comical. And, and they're shooting this all live. Correct. Yeah. This was, this yeah. was live and I was trying to keep it together. So do you remember the day when they told you you had made the cut and would be on the show? Well, I remember the day that they told me that I didn't make the cut and that my episode would not air because there were 40 of us. And out of 136 or 140 people, only 96 people aired that season. So it was the last day of season four, and I still have the email to this day. And it was me and, you know, 40 other people with deals, without deals saying, you know, we told you from the whole time that until you actually saw yourself on TV, that's when your episode would have aired. But we never saw ourselves on TV. So we just went through the experience. Ah, so you got selected and they shot the show and you're like, all right, we're basically there. Yes. You only had one step to yes. go. And that was for them to actually air it. And the producer said, eh, they pulled it off and you never got it. Right. There. So they, t you, they only air two thirds of what they tape. So I was the hundred, there, there were 140 people that taped that season out of, you know, over 30,000 people that applied. Wow. Yes. Wow is right. So with all that said. So were you like just deflated? <laughs> were you just like completely bummed out? You know, I think everything happens for a reason. And literally after that experience, so many other opportunities came. And to go through the experience of being on Shark Tank, it taught me a lot. It taught me how to really be in the unknown for a very long period of time. Like imagine from July summertime from the first or June when I reached out to them until like the end of October or November when they stop airing each new season I was in the unknown the whole time through that whole experience, not knowing if I was ever a going to get a like really be able to pitch. Will I get this experience? You know, because every time they hang up the phone with you, it's like until you see yourself on TV, nothing, none of this might happen. Like you might not get a call next week. We might not even have you come here if you don't. They do what's called a pre-pitch where you pitch to the producers before you pitch to the sharks and, you know, I would say 20% of the people even there get sent home. So you go through all these steps and you're just put up to this challenge all the time. But the biggest thing I learned and for all of the people listening who are entrepreneurs, I mean that you live in the unknown every day. Where is your next client coming from? How is it? Where are you getting your leads from? Where is that next client and lead coming from? You never know. Like, what problem are you going to encounter tomorrow, right? My problems today with the pitch queen are a lot different than my problems with that company because every day in that company, I would go to work and maybe a refrigerator went out overnight. Or in San Diego, four or five years ago, the power outage went out. We lost all the food in our store. We lost all the food in our commissary kitchen. Imagine losing all of your inventory in like one day, <laughs> You know, yeah. it's like every day I was in the unknown, but I got so good at being in the unknown that I'm like immune to it now. And not, not any problem phases me. I just sit there and figure out how I'm going to solve it. The idea of embracing ambiguity. Correct. Yes. Just never know. Well, on your website at the Pitch Queen, you talk about uh, the 10 secrets that you should know to be an yes. entrepreneur. I don't know that we have time <laughs> to go through all 10 of them, but why don't you cherry pick a few of those and give them the to cherry us. pick a few? Well, I mean, I think <laughs> it's best if everyone just goes online. All you have to do is put your email in there, but it's really, it's like the 10 biggest takeaways from the 10 years that I had my last company before I had to close the doors. And I would say that the biggest thing of that is going to be, well, being in the unknown for sure. But for those of you with teams of people, I cannot tell you, like now I can run probably an HR department of a pretty massive company. I know every scheme an employee is going to pull on you. I know every trick that they're wanting to pull on you. Like you need to protect yourself. So 
I do recommend that if you are in business for yourself and you're an entrepreneur, solopreneur, business owner, whichever one of those words resonates with you the most, that you go and get some really good A, legal help when setting up the business properly, and B, make sure you hire an outstanding HR resource. I had to figure it out myself. I was probably in labor court a few different times with different employees on issues. I won every case. I had different issues because we were dealing with some employees that were cooking food versus some in retail. So really get your um, infrastructure set up properly because these are things that you just don't think about. You're like, oh, well, I'm going to start my own business. Okay, well, do you know everything that's entailed? Number one, you signed up for a 24-7 sales job. When you say that you're going into business for yourself and you want to run your own business, you have to remember that you're selling 24-7. That your revenue in the door is your livelihood of your company, right? And every time you deal with an HR issue or every time you deal with like a business entity issue or any time you deal with some problem because you're dealing with, you know, you're in the unknown every day, right? And this email comes through and it just totally ruins your day. You're derailing yourself from the sales of your business. And yet, Michelle, you had said that these were tips that you had learned in the last 10 years when before you had to close the yes. door of your company. Why did you have to close it? I closed in March of 2017. Uh, we were undercapitalized. We ran out of money. And three big things happened on my birthday last year. Number one, I rented out our kitchen during off-peak hours, and my head chef decided to call me and tell me, well, he didn't decide. He called me because he was like, what the heck's going on? But imagine that basically I Airbnb'd my kitchen, just or my, you know, my commercial mm -hmm. kitchen. It was in a small host kitchen, 10,000 square foot, and the people that were renting decided that they were going to leave through the middle of the night and get out of their rent payments that were still due. That was problem number one. Problem number two, we were engaged with a company that does a lot of supplements in GNC. They're one of their biggest suppliers. And they wanted to create a direct-to-consumer prepared meal delivery to match the supplements that go along with their online workouts. So we were in month number two. We were getting a monthly retainer, but we were thinking, okay, this is the next biggest opportunity after the vitamin shop and Costco and all the challenges we had with those two test projects. Well, on my birthday, they called to tell me that they are not going to move forward with fresh prepared meals and that they really appreciate all of my knowledge, but they're not going to move forward. So that happened. And this happened the same day that Correct. you found out? The same UFO? exact day, and it was my birthday. So the universe was telling you something. What was the third thing it was whispering in your ear? The universe was telling me something and I was seeing our competition, you know, there was in the last 24 months, a ton of people came in the space of fresh prepared meal delivery, be it meal kits or fresh prepared meals. Some of our biggest competitors closed within a six month period of us deciding my fit foods, the fresh diet, freshology sprig up in San Francisco. There were some really big ones that have been around a long time and to make money and pay investors back in a fresh food space type business, which has a ton of overhead, you need to be really, really, really well funded. And our funding had gone away and we were not able to raise the funds, which was about an $8 million round in time to really get to the next level. So it was the worst day of my life and maybe the best day now that I can see because I'm able to take all of these experiences and share it with so many people. Even some of the consulting work I do with companies just like mine that are still going I've already been there. I've made every mistake and I can save people hundreds to millions of dollars by just giving them like five minutes of my time. So I get paid a <laughs> <laughs> five minutes, hundreds to millions yeah, of so dollars. Okay. Just think about it. The thing that you're really, really good at is the service that you can probably get paid the most on because people will pay top dollar for you to solve some of their biggest problems. And I mean, literally this just happened yesterday. I'm not going to name the company, but they do exactly what I've done. And they wanted to get into corporate. And I was in corporate. We worked with a really large hospital chain here in San Diego. We worked with a big vending company, nationwide vending company, where a lot of the, 
you know, VC funded startups in Silicon Valley, they buy all their snacks and foods and keep them healthy for their employees. I mean, we were doing a lot of revenue from a couple of massive corporate companies. Well, the second their budgets get pulled, guess who gets Guess who you, you lose your revenue. They don't order any more food. And you can only get quality food in the corporate environment for so long. <laughs> so we had to learn the hard way. And I said, you know what? You can't be everything to everybody. Focus on one, maybe one other distribution channel or where is 80% of your revenue coming from? So if you're making a million dollars in revenue a year, where is 800,000 of that revenue coming from? And just focus on that one thing, because that's what I did not do, which is why I don't think the company worked. You know, We were doing what I call wholesale retail, vitamin shop Costco. We were direct to consumer. We were shipping to people's doorsteps. And we had a retail couple retail options here in San Diego. We were trying to do all of these different things. And when you, if you're doing everything, you're not going to do that one thing really, really well. And so we had literally a 10 minute conversation and she goes, you're exactly what I needed to hear. Thank you. And I said, yeah, no problem. I just saved you about a million bucks and, uh, you know, <laughs> and devi deviating your focus on something that I know is not going to bring you the revenue that you're doing on your main core business. It's just not going to happen. And I can promise you that because I even saw the other companies that went out of business try to do the same thing. Uh, you've been there, done that. Yeah, but if you want to double your revenue and work half the time, what are you really great at? And do that thing. And people will pay a premium for knowing your knowledge and your experiences and pay you for your services. Yeah, that's so true. In your list here, I've got in front of me, number three, you have understand fear yes. and failure. Now, everyone has to combat fear and failure, but what do you mean by understand it and how do you <laughs> go about that? Well, you need to understand it. So like for me, right, with my last company, I understand the failure that it was and I understand the fears that I had going through those. Some of them were traumatic experiences for sure. So that's what I mean by understanding it because if you don't acknowledge it and accept it and you're like, oh, well, I have no failures and I have no fear. I don't fear anything. Well, then that's probably not really true. And that's the whole reason I started Success Unfiltered, which is my podcast where I literally have unfiltered conversations with people about their fears and their rejections of and fear or their fear of rejections and their fear of being told no. And I mean like some really cool people like Justin from Justin's Peanut Butter and Mel Robbins from her five second rule book. I mean, it's really cool because these people are speaking authentically, but they've, they've come to terms that there are failures and there are fears. And if you can't accept them, then how can you move forward? Then tell us the greatest fear and the greatest failure that you had to accept, acknowledge and overcome. <laughs> Well, I would say definitely, you know, I don't see it as a total failure anymore, but I did think on March of last year that the closing of my business was one of the most massive failures. That is not how I thought the ending of that story was going to go. But I looked and said, you know, I tried everything. I did everything in my power. What are the things that I learned? How, do, how can I see this from a positive? And now I'm getting to share it with millions of people, right? So I would consider that the biggest one. And I would say the fear, one of the biggest fears I had was with our vitamin shop experience. I only had six months to prove out the model. I was dealing with a billion dollar company. I don't know if you can understand how difficult it is to work with such a massive organization like that. But I mean, I was in design meetings with their graphic designers to the planning meetings with their operations people to coming and working with their HR people to hire a sales team because the vitamin shop never hired sales people. They only hired health enthusiasts, which were more of an educator type. And my fear the whole time was, if this doesn't work out, I don't know how we're going to climb out of this hole because that was generating the revenue and the margins that we really need to scale and grow. And then that came to a screeching halt on the six month mark. I got the phone call saying, unfortunately, this is going to require a lot more resources and you know, we've given everything we can and we're not going to move forward with this project. 
So, <laughs> so you had six months invested in this. You were we all in year. and nothing to show for it other than experience. Correct. It was a year. It was a year from start yeah. to finish. But it was also the best experience because pretty much no one's ever done that before, especially a small company. And they chose mm-hmm. us over all of the other competition. But when you can... You have to face your fears in order to acknowledge them and say, you know what, fear, you need to set aside because you're actually stopping me from getting me to where I need to go and where I want to go. So a lot of our dreams, goals, aspirations, everything like that usually is stopped due to some sort of fear. I never fail. Right, <laughs> right. So if you can just say thank you, fear, and just like talk to it, like what if you actually just, you know, said, okay, that's Mr. Fear talking or Miss Fear talking. I really appreciate the feedback, fear, but I'm going to set you off to the side and you're going to go sit in the sidelines while I go perform my duties. And, you know, that's how I see it now. Some of the people I reach out to to have on my podcast, I'm like, oh gosh, what are they going to say? I'm like, fear, just get out of the way. Let me just ask, what's the worst thing they're going to tell me? Not right now or no. But if I didn't ask, I would never know. So I have a 50-50 shot. (laughs) Absolutely. So you've got these three steps for a killer pitch. You want to talk a little bit about that and where people can download this? Yes, definitely. Hopefully you can provide the link, but it's at thepitchqueen.com forward slash rock hyphen your hyphen pitch. So it's kind of a complicated one. We'll definitely have a link in the show notes so you can go (laughs) over to the site to get those. You can go there, but it's really like those three steps to rock your pitch and get more sales ultimately. And I don't want to give it all away, but you know, (laughs) one of the things is really understanding what is the problem that you're able to solve. And what is that like, and I know that sounds pretty general, but really if you spend some deep thinking time when you're going through the worksheet I made, you're going to come up with some maybe new things that you haven't thought of before. And, you know, ultimately with our products and our services, we're creating this quote unquote dream result for the end person. You know, with the food company, for example, it was, wow, I have so much time. I can spend time with my family. I can spend time with kids. I can go to yoga class and the gym. I don't have to grocery shop. I don't have to clean. I don't have to cook. I don't even have to clean my kitchen because I didn't even make it dirty. You know, it was like this dream solution for them. So I take you through a process like that. And then you come up with, you know, uh, what you could consider your elevator pitch, Uh, you know, on Shark Tank. It was about a 90 or was it 60 seconds? I think it was a minute, maybe a minute and a half tops pitch. So it takes you through that kind of thought process. So you can come up with your pitch. And this is just a three-step process. I have a more in-depth one too, but let's just start with that. Okay. And we'll have a link on the site. And so in all of this, and you've been around and you've been working with billion dollar companies and nearly on Shark Tank, but going through their entire process, you built a company only to lose it. And now you (laughs) were working with other folks. I mean, that's great. uh, You learn a lot and very valuable to your clients. What do you think are the two or three primary takeaways that anybody could use when they're out there sailing the entrepreneurial seas and the storms hit? You know, what do you do to get through it to take that next step? Definitely get comfortable in being in the unknown and being able to be with the unknown. And, you know, you can practice that every day by driving a different route to, you know, if you work at an office, drive a different way every day. Don't rely on your Waze app that's just going to tell you the fastest. What about being in the unknown with sitting in a bunch of traffic that you didn't expect to? So there's different fun things that you can do every day to practice being in the unknown. That's number one. Number two, really understand who you're helping and who you're serving. And the more people you can help and serve, the easier and more fun your entrepreneurial journey uh, will be. You're you're, would you say sailing through the seas? Your tie, mm-hmm. the waves in the water will be a lot less bumpy <laughs> if you really, really hone in on who you're helping and who you're serving. But also understand that it's all about them. And that was a hard one. That was a hard one for me to understand, but I clearly understand it now. You are here to serve people and help them. A sale, wherever that next dollar in your business is coming from, has nothing to do with you. It all has to do with your client. 
if that makes sense, or your person who you're serving and helping. It's all about that. It totally yeah, does. Yeah, I was doing a workshop earlier today, a business of story workshop with a very, very large utility here in Arizona. Uh-huh. And I was working with their internal communications team. I was taking them towards the end of the workshop, the last third of it through the 10 step story cycle process. And they each sit there, they got one minute to fill in kind of each chapter, uh-huh. each one of these steps. And we first one is always okay. So, and, and by the way, this is a business challenge or an opportunity that they're wrestling with. So they're applying a real world communications challenge to the system. And the first chapter is always the backstory. You know, where you Mm -hmm. been, where you now, where you're going, set the stage for whatever this initiative it is that you're selling to your audience. And then the second, and I love this, the second chapter is I say, okay, now it's called Who's Your Hero? And what I want you to do is envision a person, a real live person, ideally, that is at the center of this story that demonstrates the human impact your initiative is having on a company, the world, the team, whatever that might be, or maybe it's a customer, but identify who that is and place them at the center of the story because that's what the story is going to revolve around. And they all, I mean, you could just see them physically go, what? Stop. Er, You know, record scratch. And I give them a minute. They start noodling through that. And then I asked them, I said, was that difficult for you? And they all kind of grinned and said, yes. And I go, why is that? And the one lady raised her hand. She said, because it made me reframe my story from being about me to being about them. And I said, absolutely. So what you're saying right there, that is the most critical thing. These stories are about your audience so that they can live into them and connect with them so you can help them achieve what they want. And then they will go out of their way to help you get what you want. Right. And your story can help, you know, bring credibility to you. Like you said, share, where did you come from? Why do you, why should someone work with you? And what do you know that they could benefit from? But that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It ultimately comes down to it. I'm going to ask you my last question, the same okay. question I asked them and, and this Young lady, Jen Gay, got up and just gave a great story. So from your past, Michelle, and sometimes this goes back to even when you were a kid, you know? Okay. Can you take us to a moment in your life that at the time seemed insignificant to who you are today, but now in hindsight, you realize that that moment, something you experienced has shaped and informed who you are today as the pitch queen. Can you take us to that moment and and take us through it? Sure. I guess the only thing that really quick popped in my mind was that, this is really funny considering we did talk about health today. My dad would take me to a donut shop every single morning before school. So I would have a chocolate donut and milk for breakfast every single day. And what I what I learned at that time, I guess is what I learned is routine. I do not eat donuts and milk every day anymore, but I do have a morning routine. And I think because my parents had a morning routine, I got used to having routine in my life. And that I do believe that with routine, you do you can create more, you know, opportunities throughout the day because you're organized and you know my morning routine has now shifted into getting up and going to the gym and drinking at least a half a gallon of water I don't drink a half a gallon of milk and a few donuts any and eat donuts for breakfast but I, I I always remember that gosh like why did my dad take me to the donut shop every day but that was our morning routine and that's how we hung out <laughs> And it now serves you today. It does. As the uh, entrepreneur you are and to help getting you organized to be powerful yes, each and every day. I am, I am super organized and highly, highly, you know, hope that all of you can take organization to a whole nother level because the amount of things you can accomplish in a day when you're organized versus if you're in chaos is very, uh, very impactful. Yeah, without a doubt. And, you know, we all find ourselves in chaos, even if when we are organized, it's just being (laughs) intentional about getting there so that you can kind of ward off that chaos. Yep. Well, Michelle, where can people learn more about you, listen to your podcasts, and are you going to be speaking any place anytime soon that they might take you in? So the best way to find me is to go to thepitchqueen.com and type in your email address, and then you'll also get my ebook that I wrote. So I think that would be number one. And again, these are the top you know secrets that I think all entrepreneurs need to know, but no one talks about them. It's those things that just entrepreneurs don't want to share with each other. 
other, right? Like those. So that's number one. Number two on social media. So Facebook, it's the pitch queen, Twitter, the pitch queen, Instagram, the pitch queen. And that's where the best place to find me. And then if you want to, you know, join me on my podcast, it's called Success Unfiltered. It's on all of the platforms, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and again, it's Success Unfiltered, where every Wednesday, it's an interview with a guest, and every Saturday is just me teaching on something related to sales. So last week was all about building relationships and rapport. I think this Saturday or coming up is about working the room. So I talk a lot about my NFL combine experience and how I came with like mug shots of all the strength coaches from all the teams and how I find the people that I want to find. So Saturday is more of a teaching segment, but it's super fun. You can have your, I call it you know, enjoy your morning cup of joe or your hot tea every Saturday morning with me just for 30 minutes. <laughs> and I love the title for your Facebook live show. Coffee is for closers. Yes. You know, one of the most famous lines out of Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, one of my all time favorite movies. It is. Coffee is for closers. But I do. I just love espresso. So that's why I came up with that name. But ultimately, gotcha. it's all about how can you sell without selling and how can you serve more people without being pushy and without being sleazy. And that's what I teach. Awesome. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for being with us on Business of Story. Yes. Really appreciate your time here today. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. And the next time I'm over in San Diego visiting Corbin, our daughter over there, I'll track you down and see if you're around. Although I'm going to call two weeks in advance and say, hey, I'm going to be in your neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, do that. Sure get on your <laughs> do that for sure. <laughs> I would love that. Awesome. And thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. If I can be a service to you, you know where to find me at businessofstory.com, as well as all the different storytelling tools you can use there and download. And uh, do me a favor. If you like what you're hearing here, share this show with someone. Give it to a friend, a family. Let them know that you're listening to Business of Story, that it can help them too. And of course, we always love those ratings and those messages over on iTunes. So let us know. And until next week, when we have another marvelous story artist on, like Michelle, I want you to always remember the most potent story you are ever going to tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. See you then.